Welcome to Compassion in a T-Shirt. I'm Dr. Stan Steindl, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Rose Horton-Smith, registered nurse, registered midwife, clinician, and researcher. Well, welcome, Dr. Rose Horton-Smith, um, to Compassion in a T-Shirt, in session. And I'm very delighted to get the chance to speak with you because uh, we've had quite a long time interacting, um, especially on the interwebs, whether it be Twitter and, and, um, and so on. And so it's, it's really uh, delightful to, to get a chance to, to hear a little bit about your story maybe and, and um, and also your relatively recently finished PhD, um, but maybe a bit about your wisdom in and around compassion. So um, thank you for, for coming and talking to me. Thank you, Stan, for having me. It's an absolute delight and honor, and I'm um, excited to be here. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Good. How are things over there in the UK at the moment? We're good. Yeah, we're good. We're getting used to being out and about a bit more and, and all that brings with it. And um, yeah, it's beginning to get back to some sort of the new normal, as everyone talks yeah. about, the new normal. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. So, so different to, to um, what life and, ever was. And I think it, and I think it's sort of, catches you by surprise doesn't it sometimes you're sort of just jogging along and then all of a sudden you see that or you and you think oh, this is weird this is this really weird is weird <laughs> exactly that that's you, you sum it up beautifully i mean it, it catches you by surprise and it's just this sense of of the weirdness of it all but um well where we often like to start i guess is is just to Hear a little bit about you, I suppose, and, and you, you sort of maybe your your life or your work, you know, a, a bit of who is Rose really is, is sort of what, what I was curious about. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about, about you and your background. Well, um, I'm a recently early retired palliative care nurse I'm here in Hereford in the UK. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm a mum to two grown up daughters and two Springer Spaniels, okay. which I think is very important to put out there. Um, I love my sewing and reading and my garden and connecting with people and, and learning new stuff, actually. Learning is a real passion for me and, and I, I love that. Um, as you say, I've recently completed my doctorate here in the UK and um, looked at uh, my research was um, researching male, informal male carers, um, caring for those with cancer and or dementia at home. Um, so that was a big chunk of my, of my learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I volunteer with the Alzheimer's Society here in um, Herefordshire. Although at the moment that's all suspended due to the pandemic, there's, there's um, a very limited, if any, face-to-face -face interaction going on at the moment. So, um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's a bit about me, I think. How long did you work in palliative care? Uh, a good a good while, Stan. My my career is is <laughs> is is quite varied in that I started in intensive care for a, a, again a, a a good while and then went off to be a midwife and um, did that for a while. Um, but it always um, I did a bit of palliative care in between those two jobs, and and always wanted to get back to it. So. Um, after a, a, a span of being a midwife in a very busy city hospital, um, wanted a change which coincided with a move to Herefordshire and a much calmer <laughs> existence, really. Um, and I moved back into palliative care. So that through um, the local hospice and then as a clinical um, nurse specialist. And I did that for about 13 years before I um, before I. Um, took early retirement, career gap, whatever you want to call it. 
how, how would you kind of describe the, the palliative care work? You know, what, 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 when you reflect on that, what, 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 how do you sort of think of that or describe it or feel about it? My role was a community post. So I traveled around and, and cared for people at home. And it's uh, it, in this country, and I'm aware the, the structures are different in different countries, but in this country, it was a, um, a specialist role. So we were, um, uh, we were caring for um, complex, system, um, complex patients. So uh, complex symptom management, complex psychological needs, complex uh, spiritual needs. Um, and really supporting other professionals to do their jobs, their hands-on, their, um, their role in all of that, and just providing that sort of um, specialist role, really. Mm. So um, a lot of supporting patients, a lot of supporting families, providing that psychological care and the spiritual care and, and managing um, a an ever increasing caseload in the in the community. So um, it was very varied um, and absolutely amazing. The best job ever, absolutely the best yeah. job ever. <laughs> yeah, covering uh, sort of across the the physical, the psychological, the spiritual. You know, really trying to work with the whole person, I guess, and 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 the well, not even the whole person, but actually the family or, or this the, the the sort of the relational system around a person as well and 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 at a very um sort of very important phase or time of of one's life and at a time that you know for some comes unexpectedly out of the blue for others who have had time to get used to the idea if you ever do and um that your that your life is limited and those conversations are are tough you know are, are tough so um it was a very wide-ranging role um and i loved it so was that where the um, the idea for your PhD kind of sprung from that, from from working in homes with people? And you mentioned informal carers at home, working male carers actually working with or looking after to, uh, loved ones, I guess, in the home. Yes, absolutely. Um, it initially um, came from my um, MSc, which I'd done previously, which was a bereavement study, and. Um, that was um, looking at carers and that what came out of that study was this idea of carer loneliness and isolation and within those carers there was a, um, a mixture of dementia carers and cancer carers but it was a bereavement study so they were looking back at their experiences so what I wanted to um, to explore further was whether that idea of isolation and loneliness, how that started actually in in the whole caring um, as it happened, if you like. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to explore that further, um, looking uh, doing the the literature reviews that you do before all of this. Um, it was evident that that the, the male carer's experience was not well understood or actually researched. Um, and so I focused in on, on male carers. Um, the, um, the recruitment process was then uh, devised and uh, accessed through GPs here in the UK and through the Alzheimer's Society to get dementia carers. And in the end, I ended up with a, a mix of cancer carers and dementia carers. And as it happened, they turned out to be husbands caring for wives. Right. The recruitment process could have led for other, other um, combinations, but it ended up being husbands caring for wives. So um, it was a qualitative piece of research using phenomenology. So the exploration of, of the lived experience for, for those particular people that I was um, looking at. Um, and through a series of, of steps, um, um, 
immersing myself in recording um, interviewing um, carers um, over three particular points of time to see if their experience changed. Those interviews were about an hour, an hour and a half and transcribed and uh, we uh, got uh, themes from those and the process of processes of IPA mean that you distill those experiences down and down to the to the the super experience if you like the super super themes um, and after a lot of um, hard work I got my super themes um, which uh, formulated the experience and I then looked at those in more detail um, so those um, then formed the discussion and making sense of the experience. Um, so the first, the first big superordinate theme I, I kept described as when being with, when being with becomes caring for, and though that um, that theme had marriage at its core and gender and the complexity of the caring role. So um, we, I looked further into um, those themes and for the men interviewed, um, the transition to carer was a very, um, um, wasn't a defined route at all. They were describing their marriage to their wives and their, their marriage vows and it is just what you did. So there, there was no distinction between being a husband and being a carer. And they felt that to be classified as a carer was, was they didn't get that, you know, because they were being a husband and that entailed caring for their wives, whatever. And, um, and so that uh, um, came definitely out in the, in the data and, and in what they told me. Um, so having looked at the institution of marriage, gender came out as, again, as a really important um, issue, because when I started asking them about um, th what they thought of as a carer, then they thought a carer was somebody who was young, who was female, and most likely a nurse. And they didn't attribute those um, beliefs and ideas to being a husband. Those two didn't match because, um, you know, they, they saw themselves as, as obviously being male and um, men aren't naturally carers in their eyes. And that, that was really interesting um, because the social construct of what it is to be male was really strong and to be a provider and to be a um, um, to be a practical source of support and so they approached their caring role very much from that stance so when they needed to care for their wives they went into practical mode and they you know outsourced the gardening they outsourced the cleaning they outsourced the cooking in some instances because that was their way of coping with the bits they were no longer able to do within their role of husband so it was a really um interesting um view of of what it is to be male and and that could be a thesis in itself, of course. <laughs> it was a, a small part of mine, but yeah, yes, absolutely. What, what it is to be male and to be a carer. In fact, what it is to be male, to be a husband and to be a carer, that those were all yeah. very kind of, yeah, the, the, the impressions there were very interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. And they went on to describe, you know, the complexity of their caring role. And for the for the cancer carers, um, the husbands who were caring for their wives with cancer, that brought in a whole new um, range of skills in complex symptom management for their wives going through chemo and um, dealing with pain and all the other symptoms we associate with with cancer that the, the carers for the those with dementia didn't didn't have to manage quite so um, 
um, in all cases, you know, that some of them did, but um, some of their wives were, were struggling with eating um, and, and that became a real point of difficulty for both sets of carers, how to in care for their wives through nourishment, knowing it was going to make them feel sick because of the chemo or knowing they were going to have a battle with them because their wives didn't understand the importance of needing to eat at some of the stages in dementia. So that again was a really big thing for these carers and what they were asked, being asked to take on was phenomenal. So another big part of the of the results were this sense of self and how this changed for the men I interviewed. Um, so this move from being um, um, uh, uh, their own self, as it were, um, and how this changed looking after somebody. So again, we look we found lots of um, putting their own needs to a side to care for their wives. Um, lots of um, having to maintain their wives' sense of self for them in a sense of, um, you know, remembering their wives and what was important to them and upholding them in a really caring and um, compassionate and nurturing way for a lot of the men. That was really important to them. Um, so they, that was a big change. And of course it came with loss of friendships and uh, loss of hobbies and things that we um, rely on for our own sense of self. Those things were, were changed within this caring role. I'm interested yeah. in that notion there of kind of sort of honoring and, and maintaining one's own sense of self, but also sort of working hard to honour and maintain one's partner's sense of self and both for the partner but also within my own concept of my wife sort of thing and, and being able to sort of hold that gently while also really being faced with with loss you know at the same time. Yes absolutely and that for the carers of, of of um, their wives with dementia, that was huge in a way that um, <clears throat> it wasn't for the carers of those with cancer in that the loss of cognition, so the loss of memories, shared memories, shared activities was, was more of, of an issue, I think, for the dementia carers, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that was that was really poignant and so humbling to hear. They felt that really strongly and um, which was amazing, amazing. So that, that was a big, a big part of, of the study too. And then where the isolation and loneliness came in was for the third theme really. And that I described as being separate together. So it, um, it, we looked at couplehood and connection and all those um, sort of things that bind us together as, as couples and, and also this issue of isolation and loneliness. And what became apparent was that this is much more subtle for these carers than you would imagine initially. And there's a lot of um, work out there, is particularly in the UK, as to the, the loneliness of our population and our society. And as, as we've all gone through this, this pandemic together, this has become a big issue worldwide for, for um, people isolated through COVID in this instance. But for carers, this is, this is very subtle in that, it, be, it becomes the difference between the, the sort of isolation and the subjective experience of that. So what that means to people is, is very different. And I think what struck me was that although these couples that I interviewed were very lucky in some respects in that they had the resources and the economic resources to be out and to go to the pub, albeit 
incredibly changed from how they would normally experience the pub and eating out and being able to take their wives to coffee mornings and daycare in the way that some people can't. What they were experiencing was this loneliness and the isolation of things like decision making when you're the only person making that decision you have no um uh, two-way conversation with somebody who's losing their cognition in a in anything so any decision what shall we do today when the person has no sense of what that means or isn't able to communicate makes for a very lonely existence when it's only you apart from all the decision making about treatments and appointments and the advocacy which again is huge for for patient carers for those with dementia so it it was it was a real sort of on the face of it they weren't isolated they weren't lonely in that they could meet people and interact but the subtlety of that was enormous for them mm. and and again, even within families who had ch um, children supporting them, those children still deferred to, well, you decide, you know, your, your dad, you decide what to do for mum. <laughs> you know, it was a very one way um, experience, actually. So um, yeah. that, was, that, was, that was very interesting and um, very poignant as well. So, so these these three things really the the, the um, you know when when being with becomes caring for you know that's that's the first theme and and the kind of the the, the practical and the technicalities are, around all of that but but sort of also the meaning around being a a, a man or a husband or a carer and then mm -hmm. the second one was the sense of oneself and how this changed but also trying to maintain that sense of one's partner or, or wife as well and, and um, balancing kind of loss and, and maintaining almost the, the loss of those aspects of the self but also trying to maintain those aspects of the self and then yes that that last very poignant kind of notion of of being separate together it, it, it's subtle because to mm -hmm. others around it looks like you're still with the person I guess so you're not alone but but actually it's these very heartfelt moments of, you know, what should we have for dinner? And yet that became a, a sort of a, an isolating feeling or experience, not because of anyone's fault or whatever, but just that, 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 that realisation or experience of, of kind of having to do all this kind of on my own. Yes, absolutely. And, and it, it, it was just, and I think for, for dementia carers in particular and any condition actually where, where cognition is, is deteriorating or is impaired in any way, that that adds a layer of complexity that, that isn't necessarily there within a more physical um, disease. And I think also what um, dementia carers suffer um, experience more so than others maybe is that notion that that person is still there in the physical form quite often but is a very changed person and also this notion of of carers caring for people at home in society's view that and and that becomes well if they're at home they're okay mm because being ill means hospital nice. or being ill means care facility and therefore if you're at home you can have huge needs but actually that must mean you're okay because you're at home mm -hmm. so it's a real sort of um, um, dichotomy that is hard to breach for people in the same way that somebody is physically there standing in front of you and yet they are a shadow of themselves in some instances and not the person that you remember um, and that I think is a particular um, tricky thing for carers when the two don't match almost.
It, it was interesting that your recruitment ended up with the two distinct groups, the, 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 the people where it was cancer and, and kind of coping with that and the people where there was Alzheimer's. It just, it just makes that really kind of important point that the experience of the, the, the person themselves who, who is um, who's being cared for can also then, you know, that, that then influences the carer's experience. So for example, for those where they were caring for someone with cancer, they, they had to get kind of good at various medical technicalities, you know, like maybe dealing with a porter cat, for example, or something yeah. like that was, you know, th those really technical things. But, 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 but at least the person is there perhaps in a more conversational way. Whereas for someone where it's dementia, the, the medical technicalities aren't so much, but there's this sense of, of the shadow that you mentioned before. It, it's hard to put the same service in for those two very different groups of carers yes. because their experience is so different. Yes. So different. You know, yep. and unfortunately, we're in a one size fits all type of service of health provision. So it's it's very difficult. Now, I did notice in amongst your description uh, there, and um, I think especially uh, with respect to the, the sense of self and, and really trying to maintain a sense of one, the self of one's wife, you, you mentioned the compassion word uh, and the, the, the idea that really, I mean, that is an, an enormous um, act of compassion, isn't it, I guess? I mean, and, and probably many of the men would have played that down and sort of said, you know, oh, well, no, of course I'm here for her and whatever, but actually it is, it, it's absolutely, uh, when, a, when a partner is looking after their partner or spouse, it, it's a very compassionate uh, sort of mm -hmm. moment. And, and yet, you know, in some ways, the carer probably needs compassion too, in, in a sense. So I, I suppose I wanted to yeah, ask you your thoughts about, compassion and self-compassion and, and how, how those sort of concepts might, might fit here with the, the work that you've done or in, in palliative care? I think um, absolutely. And my experience would be in both settings, through my um, research, but also in my professional life, that actually the, 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 that compassion is absolutely there 99% of the time. I cared very rarely for anybody who didn't feel or couldn't generate any sense of compassion for the person they were caring for. And, and yet some, um, some experiences in, in their lives together could be seen as, you know, a, a reason for not doing that. But actually, when um, the time comes, that compassion was there and that innate um, pres in all of us to care for um, those that we are close to um, in the majority of cases. And that, that flow of compassion to others um, was, was seen all the time, you know, in, in all the cases. I think where carers in particular and families struggle maybe is in that, that caring for themselves. And, and that comes maybe only to the point when, you know, a crisis occurs because they haven't <laughs> cared for themselves. So unfortunately we are relying as a society more and more on informal carers and the demands to do that and there's less space for those carers having the time out to care for themselves and to take moments um, either away from the caring um, you know, situation or just have that knowledge that they need to care for themselves. And the old adage, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup is, is vital for them. And sometimes when that is knowledge is given to them and they absolutely see that it is empowering because they then realize that motivation has got to flow to them otherwise they can't do it 
for their mum or their wife or their dad or whoever they're caring for. So I absolutely seen, you know, that flow of compassion to others readily, easily, wholeheartedly, but that self-compassion is, is a real sort of, oh, I could look after myself, could I? That would be really helpful. And that is, is you know, would be incredibly valuable, I think, mm. to put that, um, yeah, to particularly focus on that for carers in a, in a, in a way, mm. definitely. I was interested to hear you say that, that actually sometimes there might even be a, a history in the relationship that is difficult or tricky or something's kind of happened there or, um, and yet when it comes to a time where one's partner or, or loved one is really suffering with, with the condition or, you know, and so on, that the, 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 that innate compassion just seems to arrive, I guess, in a sense. And, and it's, so what, what are your thoughts there? What, what, what's, what is that about? I think that shows that for us as human beings, that is in us, that mm. absolutely is at our core to care for others. It may be under layers of, of um, you know, um, lots of um, things it, hidden, if you like, but actually when, when you get down to that need for most people to be compassionate is, is there and that is amazing and and if we could just tap into that more that would be so powerful and so you know um transformative for many people that and knowing it's there you know to tap into that is is i think would be really really you know really good and and yeah i it is there stan people care for people all the time and that is you know incredible to see in some ways it's it's sort of it, it's heroic isn't it in a way you know that the, the people you know are able to in a sense adapt and and kind of accept or, or kind of persist despite so much change and and you know yeah. there must be all all sorts of emotions bubbling up for people it, it must be you know, devastating sometimes the, you know, what's happening to their loved one and so on and, and yet there it is there's the compassion the motivation to sort of you know look after and, and help others no absolutely and I mean sometimes you know we would I would experience you know that sort of um you know oh he's a silly old bugger but I love him anyway you know that sort of <laughs> that sort of buoying up the situation in in the but of course I'm going to be here you know he doesn't think he's got rid of me yet you know it's sort yeah. of a a sort of a, a really powerful thing to to still hang in there even after whatever history has happened and mm -hmm. that is that is incredible it, it can come along with with different sort of emotions I guess can't it? Yeah. and sometimes it's that kind of the humour is there to, to sort of help people, you know, stick with it, the, the silly old bugger type stuff or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes it, it needs to be, you know, somewhat um, direct as well. You know, like the feeding example that you gave is, mm -hmm. is very tricky, isn't it, for carers? You know, because it's, yeah. it's absolutely coming from a compassionate place to help the person to yeah. eat and feed themselves. And yet it can be enormously difficult and fraught and, and even frustrating sometimes. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, professionals supporting them in that because, yes, of course, there are times when, you know, somebody is, is constantly trying to feed somebody who at that moment is not needing food, requiring food, re you know, wanting food as the end of their life approaches. And that is a real learning point and a real stepping back that because to nurture and to be compassionate is to, to feed somebody, you know, and to, um, to nourish them. But at the end of life, that isn't what's needed. And 
and that's a real again a real sort of crux for people but what can I do if I can't do that mm -hmm. and so I think it's uh, um, it's looking at, at that is, is important and the support yeah compassion for for the other becomes uh, sort of you know, sort of equal parts doing and 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 also kind of letting go a little bit too of, of doing yeah. you know of yeah. being able to yes really sort of um, just every sort of cell in your body wants to feed and, and nourish this person and yet sometimes the compassion really requires that that strength and courage to to sort of let certain things go and, and it's absolutely it's, very, it's an incredible uh sort of role to play and and, and you mentioned self-compassion so you know that that it, it's it's tricky with the compassion flowing in one direction i guess towards the other person what, what do you think there? Did you feel, did you feel like there were there were certain blocks to, to self compassion? Was it was it, was that a part of it? Absolutely. In that um, the initial one of the initial phases of the research data analysis is to is to identify all the the words, the phrases, the feelings that come out of the interviews, and a lot of what came out and that I didn't have time to to further and and is well documented to be to be fair is the those feelings of shame and those feelings of judgment and you know oh I'm not doing a good enough job and you know all those things do come up and were evident in my data um, that that we you know constantly berate ourselves and hold ourselves up to unattainable high standards of you know how and sometimes the carers needed to to sort of have those pointed out to them in my experience you know how can you stay awake all night and all day how can you do that you know that doesn't work so a lot of self-compassion I think for for them is just putting the needs of others first and so they just block their own needs you know they they would be exhausted but still you know oh no i said i'd keep mum at home and therefore we'll do it all and i don't want anyone coming in and lots of sometimes physical you know some sometimes concrete blocks other times blocks and resistance is not so obvious you know but actually yeah when you when you talk to them and get to know them that actually it's like i've got to do this you know i've got to be seen to be the the good daughter or the good son or the you know when it's really difficult um mm -hmm. and letting themselves off the hook is is something that they don't naturally find easy and and accepting help is is one of those you know those I can't, I've got to do it all. I've got to do it all. That's a big block to, to um, self-compassion really, is, is that need to be doing it all. Yes, and, and um, sometimes the compassionate flow towards the other does get a little bit mixed in with things like obligation or, or responsibility or self-sacrifice okay. or or feelings even of of guilt or or you know shame I'm not good enough you know and, and um, it gets very complicated doesn't it in, in terms of the carer's role and and the compassion is this beautiful motivation that's there and that that arrives you know in this in this instance and because we have tricky brains I guess there's these other things around it there's these other feelings of anxiety or frustration or or guilt and, and shame and 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 then it's hard to really imagine being compassionate towards oneself it, it gets a bit blocked mm -hmm. we, we feel like that might be too much like letting ourselves off the hook and we've got to keep going and we have this ideal version of of who we should be as a carer and 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 yeah. and i think also that that notion of of if i if i actually think about what's happening now i'm going to fall to pieces 
you know, and I'll deal with it later. That that block of stoicism or or um, yeah, being being there. Mm. And and just that notion of of, of backdraft, isn't it? The the, the mindful self compassion program notion of of if I start to approach my own suffering or or start to be kind towards myself in the context of my own suffering then a whole range of very very powerful and painful emotions will will come up come flooding in and yeah. and that's scary that's scary as well yeah absolutely. so so uh, yeah what what do you say are some tips if you like you know so oh, well if, if you imagine carers you know uh, perhaps the, the sorts of fellows that you were work you, you were you were working with in your research or, or the people that you've perhaps come across in your in your professional life or, or even even those in professional roles you know who themselves I think are often very compassionate outwards but but sometimes the self-care and self-compassion piece you know what, what might be three tips that you would offer um people who are who are sort of on that journey of 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 compassion and self-compassion i i i've been thinking about this stan and absolutely um in a way <laughs> would have would have liked to to sort of go back and and and, and give them all these tips <laughs> yeah. you know all of what i've learned and that's but the the three things i think i would i would i mean from from professional point of view obviously i would i would want them to explore that more and learn more and and be able to um give themselves skills to pass on to carers so from a very professional you know i would I would want them to be, I would encourage people to, to read as much as they can and learn and, and go on the Compassionate Mind website, um, Foundation website to, to learn about that. But I think for individuals, what's helped me the most um, in my journey, and I, um, you know, we, we all come to this at different, well, I would hope we would all come to this at different points in our lives, some sooner than others, but we'll get there. Um, I would want to um, pass on those those self care tips uh, of of thinking what what sustains me, you know, what sustains me, and whether that would be something small to do every day and get into the practice, the daily practice of doing something small that would that would give me that self-care and that self-compassion. So whether that would be creative, whether that would be out in nature, you know, getting out into the, the outside or doing some exercise, those, those simple things that we can all do to, to sustain ourselves in, in self-compassion, I think. Um, and that, that, you know, a, a deeper, a, a perhaps a more, um, um, oh, I don't know, focused attempt maybe to, to try and learn some of the soothing, soothing rhythm breathing to be able to step out of a busy time and just calm to enable you to go back into doing what you're doing. That would be a real skill that I, that I think is, is really helpful, especially for carers. Um, in that that those busy times and the complexity to be able to step back and take a minute and reground uh, ground yourself and uh, that would those would be my three tips I think. Yeah, so for professionals, uh, it, it, and and I wholeheartedly agree. You know, like to explore it more and 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 to learn more about self compassion or, or even just. The, the, the three flows isn't it and, and understanding that notion of balance yeah. across the three flows and and for professionals to learn about it and to learn the skills that well I mean that's helpful for them but also they can pass that on to carers themselves and and secondly you know what is it that sustains me you know that that's that's the 64 million dollar question isn't it because self-compassion and self-compassion is the motivation but the actual 
action itself is quite individual and, and can depend, you know, on, on who it is. is. Is it something more creative is or, or is it something more um, physical and so on? And, and so, you know, what, what is it that will really be helpful for me? What, what will help sustain me? And then finally, perhaps some of the specific practices, you know, not, not least soothing rhythm breathing and using that to, um, to, to help, yes, yeah, step out, calm, and then step back in, you know, and then that, that, that becomes the, the kind of the, the grounding practice that, that can, can keep us going. So, and, and so the last thing, I guess, is, yeah, if, if, if people were interested in, in kind of, you know, uh, sort of discussing about this or, or perhaps engaging with you or your work? I mean, where, where can they sort of be in touch or, or connect with you? Well, that would that would be very lovely if anybody uh, would be up for doing that. That would be fantastic. And um, I am on Twitter. Um, yes. So that's um, uh, Dr. Rose Horton-Smith on Twitter. And, um, and I do have um, an email address that... Um, um, which is slightly more complicated, but um, which is my name backwards. So Horton Smith Rose one at gmail.com. And okay. anybody who could get in touch with me, meet me there if they okay. had a question or, or if I could help in any way, if that would be wonderful. Well, it was wonderful having a chat with you, Rose. That, that, actually, that's very, very important work. And as you say, so poignant to get a chance to really hear from carers about, about all of these, these elements to, to, to what it is to, to be a carer. And, and so I, I uh, thank you. And I look forward to chatting again soon, not least on Twitter. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. It's been an absolute privilege. Thank you very much. Thank you.